video. Um, so let's start with a, a, a quick prayer. Um, I'll be unpacking the book of Revelations chapter 2 from verse 8 to um, 11. Um, so we'll start with a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of knowing you, the privilege of coming into your presence. We invite you into this space, God, and I ask that you would um, just speak to each and every one of us, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. Let's read together. It says this, And to the angel of the church is Simona, write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. I'll give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Praise God for his word. Hallelujah, somebody. Now, I just thought of doing a quick background on uh, unpacking, really, um, on what the, what's going on in the city of Simona, um, its environment, and how that impacted the church. Now, in my quest to find out, in my quest to research and know more about the Church of Simona, I found out that um, that this was a church that was situated in a very big city. This city was a trading center. It was by the sea. The city had a harbor. It was beautiful. It was well known for its trade, politics, its beauty, and religion. On all accounts, this, this city was flourishing. But within the city, we had the same church, this church of Simona, the persecuted church. The church of Simona was facing persecution. The church of Simona had, was very poor. But yet, it was in the midst of this big city. This city was one that bitterly opposed Christianity. There was mandatory requirement of worshipping the human emperor, Tiberius. Although certain groups were exempt from the worshipping of this human emperor, the exemption was not extended to the Christians. So the Christians had to and should worship, the, was demanded, expected that the Christians worshipped the emperor in order to live, in order to eat, in order to worship God. And many of the Christians in this church refused to do just that. And so the word of God we are about to share this evening, or rather this morning or afternoon, but depending on where you are, is just shading some light. Now, I don't know about you. I live in a big city called London. And I know that when I did some research uh, on this church, there were some similarities to my church because my, my church is in London next to River Thames. Um, there is a trading centre just next to us. The city of London is well known for its diverse cultures um, and tolerance of different religion. And we are very, very, very grateful to be in an environment like this. And yet, at the same time, we find that many churches are actually very poor. Some are poor spiritually. Some are poor physically, materially. Now, let's just start off by unpacking from verse 8. In verse 8, the Lord says this, And to the angel of the church is Simona, write, These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Our Lord Jesus is the first. By him, all things are made. He was before all things. He was with God and he is God. He is the last. He was dead and he's now alive. He is eternally God. Who can boast of a savior like our Lord Jesus Christ? Who among you out there can boast of a savior like our Lord Jesus Christ? There is none. There is none. We believe and serve a God 
who has conquered death by raising up from the dead. And I can boldly decree today that he is alive. We have a hope in a God who is alive. Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord. He is alive. Hallelujah. Now, all Christians across the world face different forms of persecution. The pressure to conform to the ways of the world. To operate and adhere to earthly, godless rules, policies. Legal threats, facing jail if you preach the gospel. You are, in fact, Christians are expected to water down the word of God. We are forced to call evil good. Like we see sex marriages within the Church of England. We are facing serious dis discrimination within the workplace. We are not even allowed, permitted to share our faith with our work colleagues. There is many facing torture, even death, across the world. The Church of Simona were being forced to worship an emperor. But they refused and were willing to lay down their all to serve God. The word of God says here in verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. The Lord knew what they were going through. Like the church of Ephesians, he says, I know your works. It's encouraging, isn't it? When we know God knows everything that we are going through. When we know he sees and knows and understands. He knows because he's been down here. He's experienced the same suffering, the same persecution. So he says, I know your works. I know your pain. I know the poverty that you're going through. I know what's hindering my gospel from being heard across the land. Now someone here is saying, well, poverty <laughs> in a rich city like London? Mm -hmm. The word of God says here, this church of Simona was poor. Yet it was in the middle of a great big city, major trade center, with a harbor next to it, city of wealth. Yet Christians in this city were living in abject poverty. What happened? In my research, I found out that their goods were going off, expiring. Could it be that they were delaying, withholding their goods? So by the time it got to the people within the church, it had already gone off. It was rotten. It had expired. How many nations are holding water from believers? How many nations are holding medication from Christians? How many nations are holding medication, food, treatment from believers? I'm sure you can relate. A city in the middle, a church in the middle of a city, and yet the believers had no food. The believers were living in abject poverty. Could it be that the believers inside the church were unwilling <laughs> to give up on the Lord Jesus Christ? To take jobs that forced them to worship an emperor? Could it be that the believers within this church were not willing to sign off the word of God? They were not willing to turn their back on Jesus in place of a same-sex relationship. Outwardly, this church was poor. The church had no money in its account. But it was rich in something. Something far more valuable than money. Something far more valuable than food. It was rich in the presence of God. Hallelujah, somebody. It was rich in the presence of El Shaddai. It was outwardly poor, but inwardly rich. It had no money in its account, but it was rich in good works. Rich in privileges, rich in gifts of the Spirit. This church was rich in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. That one day, the suffering will come to an end. One day the persecution will come to an end. One day this poverty will be left behind. Hallelujah, somebody. The Lord is saying to us today, I know you're suffering. You're suffering for my sake. I have not forgotten you. I'm aware of it. My love for you and my promises for you are eternal. And they are yes and, and, and amen in me. They are not going to change. 
My promises for you will not change. Praise God, somebody. Praise the name of the living Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus did not criticize the church of Smyrna. It was suffering, facing a lot of spiritual battle. Yet this church stood for the truth of the gospel. Jesus says here that you are rich. You're a very rich church. <laughs> You're rich. Rich in your leadership. I'm not saying that it's okay to be poor. I'm not saying that persecution is good. There's nothing good about being poor. There's nothing good about persecution. All these things hinders the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It hinders our outreaches. It hinders the unbelievers from receiving the truth of the word of God. It hinders them from knowing God as the only way or knowing Jesus as the only way to the presence of God. And we are to pray. We are to stand tall. We are to intercede with everything within us. That the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob would quench the persecution. May we also walk in boldness and courage to stand wherever we are placed, wherever, wherever we put our foot, knowing that God who has called us will do it. Material riches is good, but it's also a hindrance. A hindrance to those who are willing to lay it down in place of the gospel. I heard of a woman, I can't mention her name, but I know many of them will know. She said she will eat feces in order to stay young. In fact, she said to her ex-husband, I don't want to worship his God. That's for him. That's his God. That's his thing. It's not for me. Called God a thing. All for wealth. All for the riches of this earth, which is going to perish, which is coming to an end very soon. Jesus says this in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for, for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> the camel, as big as it is, Jesus is saying it's easier for the camel to go through the needle of the eye than for anyone who is rich. There's nothing wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with having money, but when money has us, that's where the problem is. When money leads us straight into hell. It goes on to say here that I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. There were those who had penetrated the church of Semino and they were pretending to be believers. They were pretending to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus here is exposing them, saying that there are some among you who are a synagogue of Satan. Beware of them. Beware. Outwardly, they look like a Jew. But spiritually, they have not changed. Outwardly, they look like a Christian. But inwardly, they have not changed. And I know that they're in your midst. These same type of people watch the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7. The, the Bible says this, when they heard his preaching, these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. They were so enraged when Stephen preached the gospel to them. These are the people we have in our midst. They're enraged when you tell them about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're enraged when you tell them that sin is sin. They're enraged when you tell them that God hates a sinner. They want to stone you to death. They are bitter. Synagogues of Satan. Who oppose, oppose the word of God. I'm here to say one thing. To the synagogues of Satan. Stop pretending that you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ or his interest. Enough of your outward profession of your love for Christians. Yet behind closed doors, you're plotting and planning Denying Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. Stop it. Repent. Because there's a coming judgment that will not spare you. A coming judgment for the wicked. In verse 10 it says here, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Do not fear. The Lord knew they were afraid. 
<laughs> so he came down to encourage them. Do not fear. He knew they were so scared of the persecution they were about to face. They were about to be thrown into jail. He's saying, do not fear any of the things that you're about to suffer. Persecution. We are going to suffer it. Hence the reason the Lord is warning us. There's coming a persecution that's going to be so great. Many will not even be able to bear. Do not fear. Stop being afraid, Jesus is saying. Stop being afraid. It's not a surprise to God that this, these persecutions are coming to, what? to us. He's encouraging us way before time. Do not be afraid. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 says this. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord your God goes with you. He is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. He warned us in advance. Do not be afraid. The Bible also tells us that some, some of you are going to be thrown into jail. Not the whole congregation. <laughs> some of us, the bold ones, the one who are speaking the truth are going to be thrown in jail. The ones who are going to be left will be of some comfort, some encouragement. Probably visiting us in jail. So we hope if they don't give up. Trials, tribulations are coming. Persecution is coming. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will be and will have tribulation for 10 days. We're going to be tested. We're going to be thrown in jail for 10 days. <laughs> We're going to be thrown in jail by the God haters, the synagogues of Satan who have infiltrated the church of God, who have come in and surveyed who is who, who is standing out for the truth of the gospel, who it is that they can point like a Judas. They're in there. We're going to be thrown in jail by those who are in our midst. The synagogue of Satan, the God haters. And we are to expect death. I know we don't want to hear it. Because there's no way here it says that we're going to come out of prison alive. We're going to be thrown in, in prison for 10 days. We have to take heart to find comfort in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not denying that I'm not afraid or we shouldn't be afraid. He knows that we are afraid and we will be afraid. That's why he's encouraging us now. Do not be afraid. The persecution will be from Satan. And he's going to use the godless. Those who are flip-flopping in their faith. He's going to use such characters to do that, to do his bidding. Be encouraged. Do not be afraid. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan is real. We don't see him, but his works are real. But we are to stand tall. We are to stand in prayer, fasting, seeking God in a secret place. We are to be found faithful. We are to be faithful even to the end, even until death, because we have a greater promise waiting for us, the crown of life. We are to be found faithful, patient. We are to be found courageous during this season of testing. We are to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shun all evil, but trust him. Keep our eyes focused on him. Hallelujah. If you really want to truly understand what is to come and what some of the previous matters went through, do please read John's Fox of Matters. John Fox, Book of Martyrs, sorry. I found it really encouraging. It kind of helps you to be unafraid as a believer in Christ. So do take time. Buy it on Amazon. Read it. We will be tested. 
God will allow Satan to test us because he has a greater plan and a purpose for us. God wants to purify a church, purify his congregation. He wants us to stand as great, strong witnesses to him in our cities, in our churches, in our homes, in the nation. And as we stand, we stand in faith, believing that as people see and hear as we stand, they'll surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That they'll give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 7 says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Have faith. Stand. Stand tall. Stand tall. We have a crown of life that awaits us. The reward from the Lord himself. If we remain faithful. It's not any ordinary crown. I know anything that comes from the Lord is much more precious than anything that I've seen. It's reserved for those who are victorious. It's reserved for those who are faithful. It's reserved for those who have laid down their all for the sake of the gospel. We are going to find rest. There's coming a rest in Jesus Christ. No more suffering, no more poverty, no more pain for those who are victorious. The crown wearers. For those who are sold out to the truth of who God is and presenting him in a way that he wants us to present him, not in the way man wants us to present him. And finally, eternal life awaits us. <laughs> so much more than what the earth, the world has to offer us. Eternal life in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. The people of Smyrna were tested even to the end. Yet, can we say the same about many Christians? I know that many Christians will do anything to avoid persecution of any kind. They choose to be mute. In fact, that's when they lose their tongue. They can't speak. They can't even hear when it comes to persecution. When it comes to defending the gospel, oh no. Me? No. They lose their position so quickly. They neglect their position so quickly. Yet we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ here on earth. May the Lord grant us mercy. We are set apart for God. But can people tell the difference between us and the heathen or the unbeliever? Remember this. Jesus is saying, I know your works. I know your works. We thank God for the church like Simona, persecuted church. They passed the test. They passed the test. They passed the test and their candle, the lampstand, was not removed from their midst. The presence of God remained in the church of Simona. Will the presence of God remain in our church? Will the presence of God remain in our home? Or is it even in our home? Is it in our lives? Do we carry the presence of God? Or we've so fallen, we don't even know how far we've fallen. In verse 11, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We are to hear. <laughs> Again, just as in... Um, in verse 7, it says, he, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. We need to put on the listening ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying in the Word of God, through men of God, honest men of God. Learn from what God has said in his Word. Meditate on it daily. Take heed of the commandments of God. Be aware of his imminent return. His promises to us. We are not going to believers. 
who stand tall will not be hurt by the second death. Though everyone dies, the second death is only reserved for those who do not believe, who do not believe in Jesus Christ. They're marching right into hell. Though everyone dies physically, we don't all have the same destination. And believers have their destination in hell. Christians have their destinations in the presence of God. Hallelujah, somebody. And believers end up in hell. Christians end up in the presence of God, worshipping him, being loved by him. Hallelujah, somebody. So we are to choose how we want our end, uh, the book of our lives to end, whether we are ending up in hell or we are ending up in the presence of God. Second, death is hell in fire. Jesus promises us that we are going to overcome the second death because he conquered it. <laughs> Jesus conquered the second death. And so for believers in Christ, we are promised the presence of God. The church of Simona was faithful and they were rewarded, as I already said earlier, with the presence of God in its congregation. And I pray that this is our portion for my local church in the United Kingdom, um, for your church, wherever you are, for your home, for your children, your husband, your life. May we forever be in the presence of God. May we forever be led by his presence. Hallelujah. The presence of God, is, um, the promises of God are for real, uh, forever sure and they are real. Sorry. For those who believe. Even though many of us would rather believe in man than in God. But today I just want to give you that chance to surrender to God by saying a simple prayer after me. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Change me. Set me free and let me never be the same again. I believe you died for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Saviour. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Do feel free to share the videos. God bless you.